So today we are talking about the book of Habakkuk. Now Habakkuk was written in 609, somewhere between 609 and 598 BC. So he's referred to as a prophet. Now according to Pastor Chuck Swindoll, Chuck's been preaching forever, I think Chuck's in his 90s at this point, he said this could mean that Habakkuk was trained in the law of Moses in a prophetic school. He could be trained in an institution for educating the prophets that cropped up after the days of Samuel. So he could have been a priest, he could have just been this prophet. The assumption is he was probably more like a priest that worked in the temple. And he's considered a minor prophet because of the length of his book. It's very short. So around this time that he was writing this, Babylon was gaining power in the area. Now, the city of Babylon was located about 50 miles south of Baghdad along the Euphrates River, present-day Iraq. So Babylon would battle with Egypt and conquer them. From there, they sent their eyes on Judah and Jerusalem. So we're in Habakkuk chapter 1. The prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore the law is paralyzed, and justice never prevails. The wicked him in the righteous, so that justice is perverted. And this is God answering him. Look at the nations and watch. Be utterly amazed, for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if I told you. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swooping to devour. They are all come intent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like the sand. They mock kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all fortified cities by building earthen ramps. They capture them. Then they sweep past like the wind and go on. Guilty people whose own strength is their God. So then Habakkuk responds, Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? You have made people like the fish of the sea, like the sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls them all up with hooks. He catches them with his net. He gather the, gathers them up in his dragnet. So he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his dragnet. For by his net he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he going to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? So we have a prophet of God who's complaining and looking for answers. And God replies to what we'll call the first complaint. Then Habakkuk responds with another complaint. Easily done, right? We can all relate to having days like that, prayers like that. So the beginning of the chapter, he's complaining about the sinners who are against them. He said the Babylonians are worse sinners than anyone who lives in Judea. God's people were the Jews and they weren't like the Babylonians. So why is this happening? Didn't God care about his people? Would he give them justice? Now when God responds, he says, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. And then it says in verse 6, I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. So he sent them forth 
to draw the Jews back to God. They had been falling away. And it says that their hordes advanced like a desert wind. They gathered prisoners like sand. So they were taking people left and right. They weren't just conquering these people. They were taking them with them. So they were going to use them most likely as slaves. So these Babylonians are strong and they have the best horses. They take what they want. They're ruthless. If your city is fortified, they didn't care. They could take it. Now what they do is they would build, if you had a big fortified city with these giant gates and walls and everything, they would build up these earthen ramps and come up over the walls. So think of this. You go to a beach and you see all that sand and it goes on for miles and miles. And it says that every little speck was like a prisoner. Think about how many people they must have taken in that time. They're the most powerful in the area of that time. They do what they want to do. They mock kings. They scoff at rulers. The Babylonians have no respect for the leaders of any country, any city, any province. No doubt they are meant to be feared. So then after God tells him why they're coming, Habakkuk complains again. Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? You have made people like a fish in the sea, like the sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls them up with hooks and catches them, in his net, he gathers them in and rejoices, and he is glad. So he's comparing the Babylonians to fishermen, and they are the fish, the Jews are the fish, and he's pulling them all in. And so God had appointed them to punish the Jews. Habakkuk is going to keep asking God, if the Jews are really God's people, and God is holy, how can he let these people punish them? He goes further by telling God, as if he didn't already know what type of people they are. The Babylonians treat the people of the nations as if they were no better than fish caught in a net for the fisher's enjoyment. He asked if God will continue to let them go on killing and plundering. Now many of us would have a lot in common with Habakkuk. You know, when we go through trials and struggles in life, we complain about them. How long will this last? Why is this happening to me? What did I do wrong? Don't you care about me? Have you ever said those words to God? Now, God knows what's going on in your life, just like he did in the time of Habakkuk. He's not too busy working on someone else to lose track of you. Now, he wants his people to trust him. And I've got some scriptures here that reiterate that. In Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4, it says, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? Mark eleven twenty four says, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. In Psalm 13, verse 5, it says, But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. In Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4, it says, You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Psalm 40, verse 4 says, Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. In Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. In Jeremiah 29, verse 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now those are just a few examples of what we have. He wants our trust. Now God, when He says, trust me, He doesn't make it easy. You, know, it's, you find out when you can really trust somebody when things are difficult. And it says that God tests the heart. In Proverbs 17, verse 3, it says, The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. 
He's wanting us to be more like Him. And He does that when He lets us go through these trials. You know, He wants us to be holy, to be pure, to be righteous, to trust Him, to obey Him. No matter what we're going through. Now, He's kind of like a gardener who comes upon an overgrown garden. Have you ever been somewhere and you've seen these just immaculate yards and gardens? And then you come back years later and it's empty. Everything's overgrown and you can't see those spots where everything, you kind of walk through it as a path. You know, there used to be lines etched everywhere. And the house is painted nice. And the garden, all the hedges are trimmed. And all the plants are kind of under control. But left alone, it grows wild and goes in all these other directions. Now, we think about the beauty of that place, but that's what God is kind of making us. We're that wild, overgrown property. You know, you go to a house and you see that the grass is waist high. You know, God's going to come in there and trim it all down. You know, it's, it's all how our lives can get. We can get overcome by all these other things in life. You know, we can get overcome by work or it's a relationship issue or it's a financial issue or it's a physical issue. We're going through all these things and it's distracting us from Him. Now think about how your lives get that way. We take a few days off of reading our Bible or praying and then that couple days becomes a week and it's a month. And before we know it, it's been so long since we prayed or read the Bible we don't even remember the last time that we read it. Our heart and our minds are filled with all those weeds growing up everywhere. We're that property We were once well-maintained, but now we're that mess. We used to think of how amazing God is, and now we only use His name as a curse word. It doesn't take long to fall away. So He has to get our attention again. We become so miserable that we start to think about Him again. We pick up our Bibles and we read Romans 12.2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you will be able to test and approve what is God's will. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now it says that He renews our minds. When we return to the prayers and start having that close relationship with God, reading our Bible, that's where we grow. That's where we become that property that's well maintained and taken care of. Now today... Each and every single one of us are struggling with some sort of issue. You could be struggling with a health issue, a financial issue, a relationship issue, or all the issues that you could possibly imagine. He's ready to deal with each and every single one. So long that you have claimed it as yours, you've held this onto this thing and this problem you've had for years and years, and you just take it everywhere you go. You put it on your back. You put it in your pocket. You've taken ownership of this thing. You always say, I've got this problem and it's just mine you know it's hard to let it go because we think we've got it figured out we think we understand everything or what's the best decision but think about what it would be like if we just put it in God's hands you know, he created this whole world he created all the people the sun the moon the stars he knows what he's doing and we can trust him with that Now, He doesn't always do it in the time that we want or the way that we want. Time for God is different from how we experience it. He lives outside of time. In 2 Peter 3, verses 8 and 9, which Linda prayed earlier, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He wants us all to come to Him. He wants us all to repent and say, forgive me. He wants us all to be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven. Now when we get there, our issues won't go with us. You know, those worries, those deaths, those fears, those anxieties, those health issues, they'll be gone forever. That deep loneliness can be filled with God. We will live with Him for all eternity. 
Now we have to make that decision. We can't just say, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll take all that. Yeah, I want that. We have to pray and honor Him. We have to ask Him for that forgiveness. Now we can join Him in heaven or we can live apart from Him for all eternity. We can't be neutral, and that's the hard thing because so many people are like, I'm not getting in the middle of this. I'm not getting in the middle of that. But in this, it's a yes or no answer. It's God or it's not God. Do we reject Him? Do we want to please ourselves instead? Now, He's asking us today if we will be forgiven, rewarded, or will you reject me and be punished? Now, why should I be punished, you might be thinking? It's because you have sinned. But some people say, I didn't know that I sinned. The Bible says in Romans 3, verses 23 and 24, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So that means we've all sinned. We all need that forgiveness. So the decision needs to be made. Is it heaven or hell? You know, it's, it's, you are either with God or you are against God. And I could tell you right now, if you're going against Him, He's going to be right. He's going to win. No matter how hard you dig in your heels or just say, I don't want to do it. I don't want to listen to God. I want to do what I want to do. He'll punish you in the end. And we don't like punishment. And if you have punishment for eternity, that's not very much fun. That's not going to be easy. There's going to be no rest, no relaxation, no break from that. Eternity. So if you're ready to make that decision, please pray with me. Dear Lord, Please forgive me. I'm sorry. I take your son Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I put him first. Father, please forgive me. Take me into your kingdom. Make me yours. It's in Jesus' name. I pray.